Okay, well, um, welcome everybody. My name is Eric Caldrup and I'm a member of the ABIPSA USA Education Committee. Uh, pleased to welcome you to this webinar. This is the third in the series that's organized by the Education Committee. So a couple quick announcements. Uh, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded. People can type um, in. Um, yes, and also, you know, please make sure you mute yourself if you're uh, just listening in. Um, and we, we plan to have time for questions at the end. So please use the chat feature to type in your questions or if you're uh, viewing the live stream on YouTube, uh, you can try typing in questions there as a comment. If you want a PDF of the slides, you'll receive an email with a link uh, in the next day or two. Uh, and uh, those of you who are architects, if you provided your AI member number when you registered, then you'll be recorded um, for one learning, one hour of learning, one learning unit. And I also just want to make a quick pitch to those of you who are not yet members of ABIPSA USA to uh, consider supporting the organization and become a member. So you can go to ibpsa.us and find the information to log in and become a member and support activities such as this. So before I get into introducing today's speaker, we also um, want to welcome uh, our sponsor, uh, Liam Buckley of IES to give a, a quick update on IES products. Liam, can you? Go ahead and take the screen. Okay, can you see my screen, Eric? Yes, we got it. Thanks, Liam. Great, thank you. So, as building design and HVAC system operation continues to, to react to the virus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been an increased focus on the simulation of ventilation strategies that can reduce the risk of the transmission of infectious diseases. My slides today will highlight seven of the most common ventilation system strategies that we have seen being simulated by practitioners in 2020. So I'm showing the agenda on the screen now. I'm just on a very light touch going to go over each one of them. Number one is air, air filtration. So aside from filtering viruses and bacteria, uh, many of us on the West Coast have been filtering carbon um, in the air. So this is basically the addition of HEPA filters or any type of filter rather to a typical HVAC system. In this case, the filter is to be clean every 90 days. So you can see the four spikes here at the top. That's basically showing system supply fan pressure resetting every 90 days once a soiled or dirty filter becomes a clean filter. Filtration systems can also be added to return to protect energy recovery devices or even localized at the zone level. Number two, relative humidity. ASHRAE has published documentation stating the most unfavorable survival for microorganisms is when relative humidity is between 40 and 60%. So here I'm showing the room target range. The ISV Apache HVAC application has a range of components to control both temperature and humidity for any given space. Number three is air dilution. So air dilution can be by way of an airside economizer, natural ventilation, or in this case, I'm showing a demand control ventilation controller. Some studies have, so, have shown that 600 parts per million of CO2 can be recommended as a proxy in some transportation buildings to mitigate the effect of virus transmission. In addition to demand control ventilation, we can also apply those same controls with parameters to window actuators for natural ventilation. Number four is air circulation. And sort of on the back of natural ventilation, with operable windows being shown here, that can have an impact on the air circulation in the space itself. So you'll go from bulk airflow modeling to microscopic airflow modeling. And then aside from natural ventilation, in this case, we're showing a high volume, low speed ceiling fan, uh, lots of manufacturers of these that will show air circulation within a large airport hangar. Number five is ultra, ultra, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. This can be either in duct or in the room. And in this case, it's showing for approximately 0 0.02 watts per square foot um, for an in duct system. It's a low energy impact, and that's based on one CFM per square foot of supply air. Number six is air containment and pressurization. The principle is simple. You're moving dirty air to 
um, from one system, a supplier to another system, there could be 100% transfer error. This can also be analyzed for a CFD study in the space, where you'll have air from a, a clean corridor, supplier in a space, extract at a bed head, exhaust in a restroom, and then transfer into that restroom. And then finally, occupancy diversity, typically used for egress for fire situations, but it can also be used for modeling for social distancing, and impacts can also be seen for power load performance. And for any other information, please go to the IES website. There's a range of free, free webinars and a technical art article on the website now. Follow the link for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. And I believe that that link is also um, pasted into the chat, or there is a link pasted in the chat for more information. So um, once again, this is Eric Calderup, and I'd like to welcome today's presenters, um, Lisa Eng and Stuart Doles. Um, and they will speak on the very timely topic of indoor air quality simulation software and application to aerosol transport. Um, so um, Lisa and Stuart are both mechanical engineers at the National of Standards and Technology. Um, they both work in the indoor air quality and ventilation group. Uh, Lisa holds a bachelor's and PhD degrees from Drexel University, and uh, she works on incorporating more accurate infiltration estimates in building energy models, and also applies multi-zone airflow and IAQ models to a range of building performance issues. And Stuart, uh, who will be speaking first, has a BS from University of Maryland and an MS in computer science from Johns Hopkins. And he works on building simulation tools, including the CONTAM multi-zone airflow and contaminant transport simulation program, which I think he'll talk a little bit about. Accurate elsification estimates in building energy models. Oh, and no, also I'm applies hearing somebody airflow echo. and IAQ models to range of building performance issues. And Stuart, uh, uh, somebody of you has too. a BS from University of Maryland and an MS in computer science from Johns Hopkins. And he works on building simulation tools, including the CONTAM multi-zone airflow and contaminate transport simulation program, which I think he'll talk a little bit. Yes, so sorry for that uh, echo there. Um, so just real quickly, wanted to finish up the, um, uh, the, uh, Introductions. So I was saying Stuart has a computer science from Johns Hopkins and he works on CONTAM. Uh, and he also works on coupling between CONTAM and Energy Plus and TRANSIS, the energy modeling programs. Um, he also led the development of the new web-based tool that they will present today. So um, welcome Lisa and Stuart and Stuart, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Eric. I think you can see my screen now. I'll assume you can. Um, thanks for inviting us to present this webinar. Um, I know most of BIPSA members uh, tend to focus on um, simulation related to energy use, so it's, it's really nice to have a chance to present, um, you know, with a focus on indoor air quality. I'm going to do a real quick overview of um, building modeling related to airflow and indoor air quality particularly as they relate to ventilation and, well, containment transport and indoor air quality. Um, I'm going to quickly address the multi-zone modeling capabilities of the NIST developed software CONTAM and touch on some of the advanced capabilities that Eric mentioned, in particular the uh, coupled energy and IAQ analysis and coupled CFD. And then Lisa's going to um, present the aerosol transport analysis tool, FATIMA, that was just recently developed. <clears throat> As we know, most buildings are built for occupants. That's us. Uh, we need to provide healthy and safe indoor environments. Uh, there's evidence that the salary cost um, is on the order of 100 times greater than energy costs on an annualized basis in non-industrial workspaces. And improved indoor air quality and environmental quality can reduce the health burden and increase productivity and have some significant economic impacts. Uh, it's a little difficult to show this, but um, the, we at NIST are developing simulation tools to address uh, design and analysis related to indoor air quality. And I 
as you energy not modelers know, it's relatively easy to show um, the benefits of improving um, or reducing energy use. Um, it's a little more difficult to show that um, with relationship to indoor air quality. So we need some metrics, um, health-based metrics to improve that and uh, simplify our ability to compare against um, you know, some metrics when we run our simulations. And what sort of requirements should uh, these modeling tools uh, capture in terms of outside boundary conditions related to airflow? It should capture uh, the weather, namely temperature, wind speed, and wind direction. And it should capture the building, namely the envelope shown up here in the top right-hand corner. Um, and specifically air infiltration and exfiltration through leaks in that building envelope, whether it be through construction, um, cracks between different construction components, leaks through light fixtures located in the attic um, or adjacent to the attic, um, pipe penetrations through the building envelope. Uh, it, it should also capture the internal structure of the building and the resistance of airflow to that. Um, whether doors are open and closed can have significant impacts on the balance of air flows within a building. Uh, and it should capture the HVAC system, in particular supply air flows to the different zones, return air flows from the zones. Uh, if the system is bringing in outdoor air intake or purposeful ventilation systems, and it should capture exhaust, the ability of air to be drawn out of the building through uh, kitchen exhaust or uh, bathroom exhaust, even uh, dryer vents. And in terms of contaminant related modeling requirements, again, it should capture outside boundary conditions, uh, specifically pollutant concentrations, whether it be from a far field source where the concentration around a building might be generally uniform uh, or a near field source, something close to the building like a, an emergency generator emitting carbon monoxide. Again, it should capture the envelope, uh, the envelope in terms of contaminant penetration through the envelope. If you have particles outdoors, like during these wildfires, the particles can come in through these leaks that I talked about, and some of them will penetrate into the building and some will be filtered out. You need to capture materials, constructions, furnishings, and the chemicals associated with their emissions from these products, maybe chemicals stored within the building or used for cleaning. And again, it should capture HVAC systems. Outdoor air intakes not only provide ventilation air, but they can bring in contaminants. And exhaust systems can draw uh, contaminants out, like from kitchen cooking. Um, and then these systems should accommodate filtration in them so they can remove uh, contaminants from the ventilation system. And it should capture people. People are not only exposed to contaminants, but they can generate contaminants. So in order to understand what the effect these boundary conditions have on infiltration, exfiltration, and airflow and vertical shafts or stacks in the building, we need to talk a little bit about building physics. Uh, this simplified model of a building looking at it in elevation view or a stack in a building um, shows a building with no internal resistance to airflow. The leakage on the building envelope is distributed uniformly, both vertically and horizontally. And we have cold outdoor air more dense than the warm inside air. And the difference in these densities lead to pressure differences across the building envelope. So in this case, the uh, pressures at the bottom of the building are lower than the pressures outside at that same elevation. Air flows into the bottom of the building. And the opposite happens at the top and the air flows out. Somewhere in the middle is what's referred to as a neutral pressure level and where there is no airflow into or out of the building. And this is a very simplified case. And these uh, neutral pressure level or pressures can be confounded by things like wind, wind blowing. In this example from the left, we see that these um, pressure plots are skewed in the, in the direction of airflow. And so it's no longer straightforward situation on air flows in and out of the building. And again, these neutral pressure levels can be confounded by the ventilation system. If we're exhausting 
air from the building or oversupplying air into the building, we can uh, draw that pressure level up or down, respectively. And of course, no buildings are really like that. They're more like this uh, image shown here, where we have variable leakage between the different zones of the building. There is interfloor leakage. Um, there's airflow at different rates to the different zones of the building, to and from the zones, different temperatures within the, within the zones of the building, some large, tall stacks like elevator shafts or stairwells. So it becomes a very complex interaction between all these um, properties, and we need uh, modeling tools that can handle all these interactions. So I'm going to talk about two different uh, modeling uh, paradigms. Uh, Liam referred to both of these in certain terms of multi-zone or macroscopic. I think he called it bulk airflow. We call it network or nodal modeling, where each zone or room is characterized by uniform properties. Uh, it's a node and an equation, a set of equations. And on the other end, more detailed computational fluid dynamics, where we subdivide the zone into many control volumes. We look at detailed airflow and contaminant concentrations within the space. So multi-zone modeling is essentially the calculation of pressures, airflows, and contaminant concentrations on a whole building scale. Again, the nodes are a uniform temperature, pressure, and concentration, but the pressure is allowed to vary hydrostatically so we can account for stack effects. And these nodes are zones, are rooms uh, in a building, or um, duct segments within a junk uh, duct network. And if, you, if you've taken uh, introductory electrical uh, engineering, you've done conservation of current in uh, electrical networks, and that's kind of what we're, um, this is similar to that, but the relationship between uh, current and voltage is a linear relationship. But the relationship between mass flow and pressure is a nonlinear relationship. So it's a little bit more cumbersome uh, simulation process. So once we um, have these pressures that are uh, influenced by driving forces from HVAC system flows, wind and stack pressures, we can solve for the air flows between the zones and through the ducts, form a contaminant mass balance on a very large number of contaminants. Once we have those contaminant concentrations in the zones, we can perform exposure analysis of the occupants within the zone. So CONTAM accommodates all these properties that I referred to. And the um, contaminant-related properties are highlighted here. Um, we can input filter efficiencies, contaminant source strengths or emission rates, contaminant sink characteristics, or a deposition of particles onto surfaces in the building. We can accommodate outdoor contaminants, whether uniform or spatially varying. And uh, we feed that into a simulation engine and get out up to a year long um, time history of occupant exposure and contaminant concentrations and even uh, building infiltration rates. CONTAM software really consists of two programs. It's been under development at NIST for around since the mid-1980s. It consists of an interface shown here, referred to as CONTAM W, where we draw uh, building floor plans on a sketch pad. We lay out the zone topology. It doesn't have to be to scale. We do provide a pseudo geometry mode. I'll talk about a little later why that's important. We can draw multiple levels. Um, we, can, we draw icons on the building that represent zones, for instance and um, we define the zone volume and temperature. CONTAM does not do a heat transfer calculation, so you must uh, define the temperatures, but I'll address that a little bit later, how we're dealing with that. And then you define airflow paths between the zones. You provide the elevation. There's a lot of different models that relate the mass flow and the pressure drop across those flow paths. We can draw complex duct systems like we show here. This is a NIST uh, manufactured house located on the NIST campus in Gaithersburg, the occupied uh, level on the top image, and uh, the duct system located in the crawl space below it shown in the bottom image. Or we can do a simplified um, air handling system I'll talk about a little later. The second component of CONTAM is the simulation engine, referred to as CONTAM-X. It can be run via CONTAM-W. It reads in a project file defined via these uh, images, 
and it forms a set of equations uh, that it solves, as I discussed earlier. And this program can operate standalone. It's cross-platform. On, it can run on Windows, Linux, and Macintosh. It also incorporates runtime control I'll talk about a little later that allows execution of CONCAM and exchanging of data with other programs. And it's been compiled into a JavaScript program. So it can run in a browser. And that's what Fatima is actually using. So there's tasks broken down into running multi-zone analysis simulations, develop a building idealization, create a schematic representation on this sketch pad, define the, define the building components. As most modelers know, this is probably the most significant task in an analysis. You have to define all the components of the analysis, and you have to get it right to get the answers out that you're really looking for. And you run the simulations and analyze the results. So here's a, a building to be modeled. It's hypothetical, so the answers are never wrong with this case. Um, this is a four-story apartment building shown on the left with an atrium in the middle. And on the right is a floor plan of one floor. There's two apartments on each level, one on the left and one on the right, and a stairway running up the front of the building. So we can idealize this building or zone it in multiple different ways, depending on the type of analysis we're trying to perform. We can do a very simple single zone, low resolution analysis, like a box model. Maybe we want to look at a citywide exposure um, to different scenarios of a bunch of buildings. Or we might uh, zone it more simply on apartment scale. And this might be how an energy model would zone something for thermal zones, where each apartment is controlled by a single thermostat. And we might uh, account for that stack running up the front of the building. Or we can go less simple, more complex, and look at every room in the building and include the attic in a detailed stair model. And this is a content W representation of that less simple model. Uh, it shows the floor plan. We're accounting for every room in the building. We have this atrium running up the middle. It's really just the same as the outdoor air. Um, we have now a simple ventilation or simple air handling system we're using instead of ducts where we um, define the central system, one for each apartment, and then an exhaust for the kitchen and an exhaust for the bathroom. And we've added some sources and sinks to each zone and an occupant that we can schedule to move around the zone. And we've defined this floor plan for six levels. Well, four levels, an attic, and then a roof so we can account for leakage up out of the attic. So that's a really quick overview of the multi-zone capability. There's a lot more to it, but just to touch on some advanced capabilities, namely combining uh, multi-zone uh, modeling with CFD. Um, we've developed CFD Zero Editor software where we can model a single zone or a group of zones interior and inside a building surrounded by other um, macro or macroscopic uh, level zones or we can model the building exterior. And this is an example showing an atrium uh, surrounded by um, some well-mixed zones or uniform zones. Uh, this is some work done by uh, Leon Huang, who is on the conference call. Um, hi, Leon. And um, he did this work while he was getting his PhD under uh, Professor Yan Chen at Purdue, and now Leon's at Concordia and still uh, going strong with some of this work. And so we can see clearly the difference between coupling uh, with CFD and without CFD here. At the bottom, you see everything is a uniform concentration. At the top, we see there's different concentrations in the surrounding zones, depending on the concentrations in the atrium and the juxtaposition of the zones in that, to that atrium and direction of airflow in and out of it. And here's some um, detailed results in that atrium where uh, Leon looked at uh, sensor placement. At the top left, we have a source um, with a sensor located very close to it. On the right, the sensor is located a little further away. And at the bottom, it's located on the other side of the zone. And we're using a control network to activate a ventilation system in, in response to that sensor. And then here is um, using it external to a set of buildings here. We can create what we refer to as a wind pressure and contaminant file, and that can become an input to a multi-zone analysis shown on the right. So we can look at uh, the 
uh, outdoor sources as they impinge on a multi-zone model, and we can see the results in this content results viewer on the right. And the next uh, type of advanced analysis is coupling uh, CONTAM with energy modeling software. Like I said, CONTAM does not do um, temperature or heat transfer calculations. But the folks at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab modified Energy Plus to uh, operate using what's referred to as a functional mock-up interface for co-simulation, and it can control the execution of other programs. And here, Energy Plus is controlling uh, this tool, um, CONTAM FMU, a functional mock-up unit, which is a sub-simulation uh, component in this um, co-simulation. And it's calculating the temperatures, it's calculating the um, airflows needed to meet the building load, sending those temperatures and ventilation system flows over to CONTAM X. CONTAM X can perform the multi-zone, inter-zone airflow analysis, the contaminant transport calculations, send those airflows back to Energy Plus and iterate for up to a year-long simulation. And this developed a set of tools to uh, simplify this coupling. And they developed, we developed CONTAM 3D exporter that takes this 2D, now pseudo-scaled CONTAM model, extrudes it to a 3D model and provide it as input to Energy Plus in this coupling process. We've done the same thing with transit, it's a very similar process. Now we can look at coupled analysis, looking at, for instance, at demand control ventilation, like Liam referred to. And we can compare the performance of the system in, under Leakey's uh, performance on the left, or Leakey built building envelope on the left, and a tight building envelope. And so the leakage can confound the performance of the system. And we can now evaluate energy saving measures and the effect on indoor air quality and look at uh, how these energy saving measures affect non control contaminants shown on the bottom there. And we can do natural ventilation analysis, look at the different control strategies with self regulating vents or uncontrolled, and identify where driving forces are insufficient to provide um, outdoor air. Maybe we need a hybrid system. There's a lot of applications of multi zone modeling. I'll let you look at this later offline. We've got some reference models, CONTAM models uh, we provide for residential and commercial buildings. Lisa's done a lot of work using CONTAM to develop infiltration correlations that can be used by Energy Plus and Open Studio Measure to apply these uh, infiltration correlations. Everything's available on the NIST Multi-Zone Modeling website. I really appreciate your time. I wish you happy modeling, and I hope you stay safe during these times. And now I'd like to... Um, introduce our feature presentation, Fatima, about a young researcher who had a vision of analyzing aerosol transport using a web-based tool, and the star of our presentation, Dr. Lisa Ng. Thank you so much. And while she's, this is Eric Calder up again, while Lisa's getting started, there is, there is one question in the, in the chat on the Zoom, Stuart. Um, so, okay. so it says, uh, when you're creating your model and its internal room dimensions, what is your most common way of obtaining those dimensions? Are you using original blueprints or as built, or are you measuring by hand something more accurate, like laser scanning? Yeah, I suppose it's a case by case basis. We don't really provide um, a BIM capability if that's what the person's asking. Um, we do allow for importing a bitmap image, and you can um, trace over that image on the sketch pad. But mostly we look at blueprints, um, and if it's like our manufactured house, test houses, we go in and measure them uh, if necessary. So up to the user and what's available. Um, and maybe one more question. Uh, sure. It's, can we call the software in MATLAB? Like, flu like with Fluent software? You can. That um, coupling capability I uh, mentioned does allow anybody to use it and control Contem X. And there have been folks doing that with MATLAB. I haven't seen their work, but I've seen people doing it with MATLAB and uh, Python. I think there's some other folks out there. Okay. Well, let's, um, there's, there's one or two more questions, but I think why don't we uh, get to Lisa and then we can come back to those questions at the end. If we have Great. Time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Stuart, for the 
very flattering <laughs> introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, I have presented at BIPSA before talking about weather correlations for infiltration modeling when it comes to Energy Plus and commercial buildings. Um, but today I'm going to present this wonderful tool that Stuart Doles and Brian Polidoro have spent uh, the, our lockdown period developing. It's called Fatima. And I've exercised this tool in educational spaces looking at uh, reduction in aerosol exposure. So I'll show you a little bit about the tool and then just some results uh, that you can get from the tool, but also results that I post processed. And feel free to put your um, questions in the chat box. All right, so FATIMA stands for the Fate and Transport of Indoor Microbiological Aerosols. I'll talk about uh, FATIMA in a few slides so you can get a feel of what the tool looks like and feels like. Um, then I'll introduce this study that we did using the tool, um, the spaces that we simulated, the parameters, uh, results and summary, um, to give an idea of what you can do with this tool given the spaces that you uh, may be dealing with. All right, so Fatima, you can find the, uh, the actual tool at this link, uh, but you can read more about this tool at this other link, as well as a report that describes the tool more in detail, the inputs, the outputs, um, and some resources on filters or deposition uh, that you might want for uh, your own use. So it's an online tool for evaluating aerosol exposure. It is currently only a single zone where the concentration inside that zone is uniform. Uh, and it, it is also uh, only a 24 hour simulation, whereas CONTAM is a multi-zone tool. It can has a lot more capability and you can do up to uh, a year simulation uh, looking at different time steps. So Fatima is only a day, only for a single zone. Over here on the right is, is a schematic of the inputs that you would put uh, into this tool, such as the zone size, infiltration rate, uh, which you know we know is not constant, which I'm always talking about when I'm um, presenting the correlations work. It's not a constant number, but in this case, uh, we're going to assume that it's constant. You're going to look at, you're gonna, you can input HVAC rates, such as outdoor air, recirculation, and any air that's exhausted. There's also a capability to put a portable air cleaner into the space. So this, the flow rate, the filtration level, um, and whether it's on or off, uh, we don't have the capability to schedule it yet. Uh, and we can also put an aerosol characteristics such as its size and its density. Uh, deactivation rate is something that's there where uh, if you were using UVGI or other, or, you are, or natural decay, you could put the deactivation rate. Um, a source, of course, you have to put in there, it can be continuous. Uh, like breathing, a talk, uh, it can be um, burst, such as a cough or a sneeze. Um, and then also looking at surface, de surface deposition, floor, wall, ceiling, and other surfaces. So if you change this other parameter, you know, if you had a room full of desks, you could have more surface deposition then. And if you didn't, you could leave this uh, value zero. And then lastly, the occupied time. So the source can be generated on a, on a schedule. Uh, and then the Occupy time can put on a different schedule. But again, it's within the 24 hour period. Um, they can be constant or they can be inter intermittent. Um, and then the outputs that you would get from this tool, um, of course, is the airborne aerosol concentration, but you're also gonna get surface loading. So how much of uh, these aerosols deposit on the floor, the ceiling, the other surfaces, how many were deposit on the filter. Um, and then of course, occupant exposure, how much um, a person is exposed to based on the uh, airborne concentration. And the results are both numerical and graphical. So this is the uh, Fatima interface. Uh, this link here will get you to the technical note that will describe what each of these uh, items do. But like I said before, it's a, it's a nice clean interface. You have all the input categories on the left and all the inputs on the right. You can drop down here for different uh, units. You know, at NIST, we use SI units, but certainly you can put in feet, cubic feet uh, and, other, um, and other units. Uh, infiltration, again, you can also put that in different units, not necessarily just one over hour. Um, and this techno kind of dives into what it is like, if you're wondering, you know, what's part of a penetration coefficient, you can go to the techno and it will describe it. Uh, but you see that it's, you know, a single ventilation system. Um, you can put in different levels of filters. You, this gets you a calculated airflow so you can understand if um, 
what's putting what you're putting in is kind of what you think it should be. Uh, and then here's where you would put the portable air cleaner for the flow rate, the flow fraction, which is um, how often if it's on or off, if it's you know on half the time, uh, or if it's on half the speed, and then filter efficiency, like if you had a HEPA filter in there or some other level of filtration. And then you have particle, the source, um, whether it's continuous or burst. And then uh, I didn't get to uh, get the whole screen screenshot it, but on the bottom you have the schedule of the exposure and also deposition. So down here you would have a run button, which unfortunately got, got cut off. Uh, but once you get um, once you run the simulation, it's really quick. You get this results page. Uh, so you have all the numerical results here. Um, what we're interested in for the study that I'm going to present is uh, this one, integrated exposure. Um, and that's just uh, how much time they spent, the, a person spent in a space and how much they were exposed to during that time. You can also download the content file that is on the back end of this web interface. And then you can manipulate it any which way that you would a, a typical content file that you created yourself. Um, so I'll just go over, you know, kind of what all this is here. So here we have the air handler unit, which you would specify the fraction of outside air, um, that's fraction of supply that is outside air, any exhaust rates, any return rates, and then the supply rate. Uh, so that's what these two icons are here for. These, all these um, C's and circles, they define either the burst source, um, a constant burst, a constant source, sinks, which is for deposition or deactivation. This icon here is where all the zone character, characteristics went to, including air, uh, area, and volume. And then all these green are um, control outputs. Uh, in Contam, you can do lots of different kind of controls, like Stuart had mentioned. Um, in this specific Fatima model, we're exporting um, certain data, which is what you can do when you download this CSV, CSV report, which is a time series of uh, the zone concentration, um, the integrated zone concentration, and then the integrated exposure. And then lastly, this blue icon over here is for the portable air cleaner. So you have the intake, the supply, um, and this is the fan where you would put in the flow rate, um, the filter, um, and how, you know, how much was, how, how much it was on, either it was on the full hour or on all the time at, you know, the 100% flow or some or uh, some other fraction. Um, and then over here we have uh, in the infiltration, which, which we um, put in as a fan because it's a constant rate as well and as an exhaust fan over here. And then this leak just balances out the system because, you know, as air comes in, it has to leave somewhere. So that's what this is. And again, it's a single zone constant. It's a single zone model. So it's not connected to corridors or other spaces. Um, you would want to use Contam to kind of you could add spaces around this one. So if you download the CSV file, this is what you get. Um, these this up top here is what you would have saw, seen on the web interface. Um, and then on the bottom here is the time series, like I mentioned, um, the airborne exposure and surface loading. Um, and this way you can do your own plot. But also on the website is a uh, downloadable template. And you can paste your results from Fatima right here. And this template will generate these charts uh, for you that the interface did for you. So you don't have to save like a poor quality image. You can get it from um, the Excel. All right, so that was a quick overview of the tool. It's really easy to use. I jumped right into it, putting the parameters that I needed. Um, and we decided to look at um, relative reductions in aerosol exposure in education spaces as a, as a result of changing the operation of HVAC equipment and also the wearing of face coverings. Some disclaimers about this study. Uh, we are looking at relative reduction in aerosol exposure. Um, of individuals with face coverings due to the controls that we were studying. So we're not going outside of the scope of the study. Uh, we're hoping data like this and tools like this can help decision makers select changes to HVAC operation that can reduce aerosol exposure. Again, this is a single zone, uniform concentration for a single contagious occupant. We're not looking like a, we're not looking at a classroom full of students and a teacher. We're not looking at, you know, dead zones in the space where you wouldn't have a good air circulation. Uh, and this study does not define a level of exposure that is safe or healthy. We're not disease experts um, or airborne transmission experts. We are simply looking at relative reduction so that when you are uh, 
offered options, you can decide uh, what may be better for your situation. And then any controls that we present here has to be part of a larger risk reduction strategy. It can't just be ventilation. It just can't be washing your hands. It has to be all together. So uh, it is only a partial showing of our results. Our full results are will be available online um, after um, after more, after further review. All right, so we took the ventilation rates from ASHRAE 62.1 2019, which I hope some of you are familiar with. It's for, it's the ventilation standard um, put out by ASHRAE for commercial buildings. And we looked at two classroom, uh, one that was for younger kids, five to eight, one that was for kids uh, nine plus. Um, and then you can see that their liters per person, liters per meter squared, criteria is the same. The only difference is that their default occupancy is different. Uh, there's more people in the classroom ages nine plus. Um, and if you're not familiar with the standard, the total required outdoor air ventilation rate for these spaces is this number times the number of people plus this number times the area. Uh, we also wanted to find out some uh, typical supply rates. So we found this also in ASHRAE 62.1, though these are not required. These are part of the informative index. Um, and then these are the two spaces that we looked at based on a California specification for emissions, as well as a portable classroom um, in an ASHRAE journal. All right, so again, we, uh, we looked at the aerosol size at one micron. Uh, we did not look at virus um, inactivation, mostly because the data is not out yet on how UVGI may affect this virus. We did look at deposition velocity. Uh, we assume that there was a contagious person emitting 500 particles per minute. So that's the constant source that's in Fatima. Uh, here's the deposition velocities. And we assumed a integrated exposure between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., which would be a pretty typical uh, time that uh, children would be in school. And we assumed um, these controls, so face coverings, both the where, what birth the per both the person being exposed wearing a face covering as well as the contagious person wearing a face uh, face covering. And when I say face covering, I do mean mask. I didn't want to say mask because mask might, you know, invoke a surgical mask or N95 mask, but I'm just talking about a, a one that you could, you know, buy or make at home. Um, we also looked at portable air cleaners between uh, one air change and six air changes, uh, as well as filters, exhaust fans, and changing outdoor air when, um, when appropriate. And all of our results will be normalized either to um, another type of HVA system or its own HVA system, which I'll go over later. And that's to really emphasize that we're not reporting absolute numbers um, because absolute numbers don't mean anything without, the, without scientific data, uh, and that's not available. So we're looking at normalized and reduction in exposure. So I wanted to just give this overview of portable air cleaners. I know that there's a lot of talk about um, using them. Um, especially with the uh, wildfires, but also with the virus um, in your space. Uh, so clean air delivery rate is something that I may mention throughout the presentation. That's called clean air delivery rate, CADR, and that's the airflow times the efficiency of part of re particle removal. And there's three test particles that are used, smoke, dust, and pollen. Um, and since we're looking at the one micron uh, size, we will look at, um, we will assume that any CADR that's the rate that's chosen is rated for the smoke particle. And if you want to convert CADR to air change, use this uh, formula over here. Uh, and we assume that there is a HEPA filter in there and that they are operated at their maximum setting. Um, and this is a chart here showing each space's volume. The uh, portable air cleaner size you might put in that space and then the equivalent air changes that you would get be, um, due to those number of portable air cleaners. So two times 400 is two, 400 uh, clean air delivery rate, portable air cleaners operated at maximum speed with a HEPA filter. All right, so we wanted to look at different ventilation types because schools vary quite widely on um, what type is they in, their, in their space. Uh, so CTL is central system. Uh, it's a pressurized system where the supply is greater than the return. Outdoor air is filtered, return air is filtered through a MERV-8 filter. Uh, these two systems are similar in that they have the same um, amount of outdoor air coming in and also uh, that um, the supply, these two supply numbers equal this supply number 
and the returns are the same. Uh, and so this is a DOAS system, 100% dedicated outdoor air system. Uh, this terminal unit or this conditioning system that's doing the separate conditioning uh, has a MERV 6 filter. Uh, this is a terminal unit system, so it's the DOAS system without the dedicated outdoor air, so the air comes directly into the system and mixes with the return air. Uh, and this is a window unit system, which has no, which has negligible, negligible outdoor air and also um, negligible, a negligible um, rated filter. Um, so again, you know, if you want to provide feedback on any of these slides, these are incorrect. You should consider this um, HVAC system. Please put it in the chat. Uh, I do want to note that uh, for the DOAS system, there's different types. This is an air source, I mean, air, air driven one where the term, where the conditioning system is air. But if you have, you know, radiative baseboard heaters, there might not be this exchange of air. Um, or if you have um, other types of units, our results will, your results will vary. And, I, and you can, and I did all this in Fatima, though you could also do it in, in Contam. We also looked at sensitivity analysis because they're not going to have a perfect face covering fit um, or you're not going to have a perfect filter. Uh, so these are the uncertainties that we added to it. 20% for the face covering. Uh, we varied infiltration between 0.1 and 1 air change. Uh, the outdoor airflow rate that's able to be delivered by a terminal unit, we assumed um, it could be 20% less um, than the required rate. For filtration, we assume 10% for improper installation or age. Uh, we assume that the portable air cleaner might not be run at the max setting, so we reduced its capacity to 30-30% of its max setting. And then the exhaust fan, uh, we assume 10% for improper installation. Um, some of these numbers were uh, arrived at through um, research for literature search, but also on um, just kind of based on engineering knowledge. So feel free to provide feedback on any of these as well. All right, so getting to some results, again, the full results will be available online in a report uh, as they are updated, but these are some preliminary. Um, though they've been vetted internally, uh, we like to just take a double look and also receive feedback and update them in, if needed. So in these uh, two graphs, you sh I show that uh, the normalized integrate exposure, which is normalized to the central system, uh, to one person, one person who's contagious, not wearing a face covering. So here, there's no controls. Um, the DOAS system and, and the terminal unit system both have 20% greater integrated exposure. And then the window unit system has over seven times greater exposure. Um, and that's due to the window unit system having no mechanical outdoor air and just infiltration. So the so this one's going to have the largest normalized integrated exposure, but also the largest error, error bars because it's really going to depend on the infiltration rate. Um, so this lower bar is if the infiltration rate is higher and this top of this bar is if infiltration rate is lower. Same thing with these error bars, though they're much, though they're much smaller. On the right over here, I show the integrated exposure still normalized to the central system with no controls. Um, and you can see that uh, with the face coverings and a 300 clean air delivery rate portable air cleaner, the reduction in exposure um, decreases to 0.3 to 0.4 when you're looking at these three systems and then down to 0.7 when you're looking at the window unit system. So on average for the central, the DOAS and the terminal unit system, you have an average 68% reduction. For the uh, window unit, you have an average 96% reduction um, over the two classrooms that I looked at. Um, but remember, uh, because this starts off so much greater than the other three systems, a 96% reduction is still going to be higher than uh, these, than if you're in a space with these other three systems. All right, I also wanted to point out that schools are typically, uh, can be underventilated uh, based on a study uh, that uh, we uh, we found um, so we simulated uh, the three systems with a half almost half the ventilation rate and we found increases of over 100 percent which means the integrated exposure doubled um, for this for the central system the increase was you know 58 62 percent in the two classrooms um, and that's because one it has um, the MERV 8 filter whereas the DOAS system and the terminal unit have MERV 6 filters as their base operation 
All right, so I'm going to kind of go over the rest a little quickly since we're running out of time. But this is the terminal unit system, and I wanted to look at the effect of each control individually and together with the face covering to see how the integrated exposure would change. So the face covering, the MERV-13 filtration, and the portable air cleaner, they reduce the normalized integrated exposure to, to um, so this relatively same number, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Um, and then the face coverings uh, with another control, except for the exhaust fan, has a lower normalized integrated exposure than individual controls. So these results, these um, I normalized uh, post-process after I received the FATIMA results, but this is something that you can also do when looking at different changes to a system um, in a space that you might be uh, interested in. Uh, this is for the window unit system. So again, remember that it starts off with a much larger integrated exposure with no controls. So with controls, the portable air cleaner reduces the normalized integrated exposure in this space down, to, down from one to 0 0.2. And then with the face coverings, you can get a normalized integrated exposure of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. I'll note here that the portable air cleaner plus exhaust fan plus face covering um, these two values, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, they're, they look awfully alike, uh, and that's because of the decimal points, but there is about a 1% decrease if you combine all three controls um, in this space. So there, again, there is a larger set of slides out there that we will um, publish uh, when they're all ready, when I get some more feedback, especially from the audience. But this is looking at the individual controls and how much they reduce integrated exposure based on its system with no controls. So you see here for the DOAS system um, and for all the systems, face coverings alone will reduce the exposure to, 50, to 0 0.5. Um, these are the individual uh, controls with no face coverings and you see the reduction in exposure. And over here you see the reduction with face coverings. So this is the portable air cleaner, the MERV-13 filtration alone, the exhaust fan, and all three of these or all these combined depending on the system. So for the central system is combined portable air cleaner, MERV-13 filtration. Uh, for these two units down, for these two systems down, or th for this system here is the portable air cleaner, MERV-13 filtration, if possible, and the exhaust fan. So again, these assume, these, con these assume that the controls are working perfectly. These values are not a direct um, metric of inf infection risk. And even though the window unit system looks like it can re reduce, reduce the normalized in integrate exposure to just 0.1, remember that it started off with the highest integrate exposure when compared to the central system. So again, the effect of controls will depend on HVAC type, and that was really the impetus for this study because there was a lot of guidance out there, including um, stuff from ASHRAE, um, but it wasn't specific to an HVAC system. We wanted to show that the effect of a control really depends on that, but also control uh, depends on how controls are implemented, like face covering fit, the setting of the portable air cleaner, um, the filter fit, uh, and again, while the exposures reported here are not a direct metric of infection risk, um, we used FATIMA to identify and compare possible control, control strategies to reduce exposure. Um, and we're hoping that this is a tool that others can use so that they under, because they understand their system the best, they understand their limitations, um, and we can show kind of possibilities there. So we have, here's my list of references. And thanks. So thank you very much, Lisa, and also thank you, Stuart. So, so we do have about five more minutes for to deal with questions. Now, I know, Stuart, you've been answering some of the questions in, in the chat. Are there some that you want to um, try to address? And, and of course, others who have more questions, please write them into chat or into the comments on YouTube. So uh, this is Stuart. I think I addressed a good number and I had some help from some other folks. Thanks, Leon, Steve Emmerich, and Dustin Poppendick. Um, perhaps there's a couple for Lisa. Um, here's one. The portable air cleaner, which I assume is a portable fan, could increase the risk of exposure if it blows air from a sick person to other people. How could you or could you include this fact in Fatima? Hmm. 
Uh, so my, my inclination is no, because the zone in Fatima is instantaneously uniform during a time step. Uh, so you could not say, you know, two people sitting, you know, three, a meter apart, a meter and a half, you can't do that. So we're assuming there's a contagious person wearing a face covering and there's a person in there wearing a face covering and instantaneously, they're going to be exposed to whatever's in the air, even if, you know, you are sitting by a window and getting, or you're sitting by a vent and getting the direct outdoor air ventilation, we're assuming that is instantaneous here. You would need a CFD model if you wanted to do something as the person is describing. I'm trying to scroll up to this question about DOAS, but it keeps resetting every time I scroll up there. <laughs> oh, crap. I mean, darn, it did it again. Um, I expect a DOAS system to have more integrated exposure than a central system because it has 100% outdoor air, but the results show the reverse is true. Can you explain? Uh, my results show that the window unit system has the highest normalized occupant exposure and the DOAS and the central system have very similar ones. Um, so either I wasn't clear when I presented it or I didn't, we didn't understand the question right. Are you saying? I mean, regardless, it's a certain amount of outdoor air, right? So I'm not sure what their point is. Um, don't see anything. Oh, is there a user manual for CONTAM CFD0? Um, there's some user guides on the NIST website. Uh, there's a documentation section. Uh, basically, that is fairly self-explanatory. There's a tutorial on how to use that tool. Uh, that's probably the best uh, thing to look at. And also Leon has his PhD thesis provides some details related to the mesh used in there. It's fairly straightforward to use. Is there a tutorial for creating content models? That's a very timely question. There will be next year. <laughs> um, there is a very short video online right now, but it's very short. So that is something we are going to try to address uh, this coming fiscal year. There is a question about, um, is Fatima interactive? Can you introduce obstacles and see what happens? Uh, that's an interesting question. I'm, I think there may be a little confusion as to, Fatima is a well-mixed or uniform uh, concentration model. So anything instantaneously mixes within the zone. However, you can, um, implement surfaces and deposition onto those surfaces. So you, you could somehow account for that. And Lisa's model is accounting for that in certain ways, but you can adjust the amount of surface area in the, in the model. Uh, another interesting question is, how does Fatima compare to the 2020 COVID-19 aerosol transmission estimator? Is that something you're familiar with? Is that the work out of Colorado State? This is or, a you know, question oh, from UC, Amina. UC Boulder, maybe. It might be the maybe. other tool, the one that has a lot of tabs. Uh, I we do know that tool. Uh, we know both yeah. tools. So there's the classroom one, and then there's there's, there's the one with many spaces, um, with a different tab for many spaces. So. Uh, so what the schools one, they're looking at you know, rating the, the, the amount of ventilation that's that's good, you know, that's excellent, uh, ideal. So I think above six air changes ideal. So in terms of that, I think the results show that the higher portable air cleaner equivalent air change rate you can get, the better because you do reduce that exposure. Um, but because there are results um, 
I have to look at if they, if they match up. For the other one that's more in depth, I haven't looked into that one. I believe that one might have things like um, like a, like a dose response or the Wells Riley. And because we don't have that here, it's not a direct comparison, but I do want to look at both of those tools again to see how our results stack up. And Leon did note in the chat that yes, you see Boulder. Okay, yeah. Um, there's also a question about whether Fatima results have been verified by any field data. So CONTAM itself, the, which is the back end of Fatima, um, has been verified uh, by field data, also theoretical and internal. And uh, Stuart can, uh, can attest to this. So while these results specifically, we haven't gone out to a space and injected aerosols and see how they've done, how, they, how the results compare, uh, we are looking at it in terms of content has been validated, so we're using these results. Um, and certainly these results are, they're a relative reduction. Um, so, you know, if it's not 0.3, if it's not, you know, if it's not 0.29, it's, it's something that we can trust because the physics behind um, content we, we trust. Uh, Stuart, why don't you talk more about that? I thought you did a great job answering that question. <laughs> Good, good, good. <laughs> well, so, so another question here, um, you know, what are the advantages of, of Fatima over CONTAM software? And what about the coupling capability of this software? Sure, um, the advantages of Fatima over CONTAM are, Fatima does not require a lot of um, learning. We provided a front end to minimize the amount of information um, or options available to the user. So if you were to start from scratch with a content model to do this, you'd have to learn content. So we've tried to develop this tool to make it very easy for folks to address this very specific problem. Um, in terms of coupling, Fatima is content, but you don't couple directly with Fatima. What you you can couple uh, CONTAM, as I mentioned. So if one wanted to do that, they would work with CONTAM. And, and you can, um, from the Fatima analysis, once you've performed an analysis, it enables you to download the project file. So then you can even open it in CONTAM and, and modify it in there. So anything else? Um, um. Well, there was a case about the or a question about the Fatima results from Kevin. So maybe I missed this, but did you study the case of an infected person not wearing a mask and differentiate the relative improvement of a receptor wearing a mask versus another not wearing a mask? Yeah, very good question, Kevin. I didn't plant that for him. Um, so initially, <laughs> initially, we did do these results without the receptor wearing um, a face covering, and we because we assumed that it was a thirty percent. Um, efficiency face covering they were wearing, um, what we did post process is then uh, reduce the airborne concentration by 70%, which would um, be a 30% 30, 30 efficiency. So if you look at my last table, um, where the reduction went from, um, you know, one down to 0.3, if you don't have the receptor wearing a mask, um, then you have about a 20% increase in exposure without the receptor wearing a face covering. And that's based on the efficiency of the mask that we assumed if you had something, you know, with a higher efficiency, then of course those results would change. Uh, is, is there a paper discussing the mathematical models slash equations for CONTAM? There is a CONTAM user guide available on the NIST website. Uh, there's some information related to the coupling between CONTAM and Energy Plus. There is a predecessor modeling tool called AirNet. Um, there's a user guide for that that gives very detailed information on the airflow calculations. There's a Axley um, uh, document from back around 1988 on CONTAM and the airflow, I mean, the contaminant transport calculations. So. 
there's a lot of information out there. And Leon Wong's um, dissertation provides CFD um, background, coupling background. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there. David Lorenzetti has addressed the details of the contaminant calculations as well. So if you, if you want any information, you can email us, um, but you can Google too. Google knows everything. <laughs> so maybe we could take one or two more questions and I, I know we've gone a little over time. So um, one, one question, I, I think I know the answer to this, but would it be possible to add this type of calculations into engines like Energy Plus? So the type of calculations are we talking about? We're not sure. Fatima? Energy Plus. I, I'm, I'm does, guessing the sort of the, you know, contaminant concentration type. Yeah, types. so Energy Plus does uh, enable some contaminant calculation. It even has AirNet. Um, or airflow network, which is based on the AirNet calculation. So you can do detailed modeling uh, in Energy Plus. Um, you can also, I think, simulate two contaminants, one CO2 and one generic contaminant. And um, yeah, so it is in there. Uh, it's, it's a little bit limited. Their focus is energy analysis. So the CO2 there is for demand controlled ventilation. So, but we love the energy plus coupling because it gives us some more realistic uh, calculations, you know, for the heat transfer and the, the building system sizing. It improves CONTAM's contaminant modeling. So we kind of think that that's the way you really should go if that's what you want. You can do both. And we've got some papers on uh, looking at this coupling and energy measures and the effects, you know, kind of as I alluded to on um, the indoor air quality, so somewhat in there. Okay, well, I think, um, I think we should probably wrap it there. I know there are a few other questions, but, but hopefully, you know, would you guys entertain uh, questions from the audience <laughs> sent to you? Uh, I think- Absolutely, the yeah. PDF, we're, right. we're public servants. There's a CONTAM user group. Uh, that's a great resource. If you go on our website, um, you'll find our contact information, but the best thing is to go to that user group. I answer almost all the questions, but there's a few other folks, Lisa, David Lorenzetti, who definitely pipe in. So we'd love to see that become more active. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to Stuart and Lisa. Um, again, I'm Eric Holdrup, and I'm a member of the BIPSA uh, USA Education Committee. So thanks to all for attending. Uh, you will be getting an email with the um, links to a PDF and, and where you can see a recording. I see there's a number of people thanking you for the excellent presentation. And uh, again, consider becoming a member of a BIPSA USA if you're not already. You go to ibpsa.us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. Well done, Lisa. You too, Stuart. Talk to you later. Bye. Happy hour. <laughs>